Hello everyone, my name is Pixarifs. Welcome back to the Hardcore Survival Guide. I hope you guys are having a good day and it's time to brew some potions. Because we have a couple of new arrivals in the village. We got one little villager over here. We have another little villager causing trouble over in this direction. I think he's probably jumping on the bed, yep, in the librarian's house. And so I want those to be a stonemason and a cleric. And I'm going to craft a brewing stand anyway because that is of course going to lead us into potion brewing and everything that goes along along with that, but it's also the workstation for a cleric villager, so I think it'll be ideal to have one of those central to the community here in our village. Let's say we put the brewing stand right there. I already have a stone cutter over here, and I placed a couple more beds in the hopes that these villagers would produce us a couple more younger villagers, and they have, so this one is currently being <laughs> looked after by the group around here, and hopefully they don't go jumping in the fountain too much. But the fountain being here is actually ideal for us to fill up some water bottles to throw into the brewing stand, and while the village are growing up, we can start working on brewing. I'm going to craft a few bottles using the glass I've traded from my librarians. We're going to fill those up here at the village fountain, and each potion is going to need a couple of things. First of all, we need some blaze powder in here to activate and fuel the brewing stand. Each blaze powder provides fuel for 20 brewing operations. Most potions need to start with a nether wart, so I'm going to chuck one of those in there. There is one potion that doesn't need nether warts, however, and that is a potion of weakness, which we may get into at some point since we're dealing with villagers and a potion of weakness is one of the ingredients required to de-zombify a villager, converting it back from a zombified villager into a regular one, and that might potentially get us some discounts further down the road. But for now we're going to be brewing up potions of other kinds, and it's actually going to involve the golden carrots that I have in my inventory. That is going to be the ingredient for a potion of night vision. Actually three potions of night vision because of course the brewing operation applies to all three of the bottles in the brewing stand. It kind of divides it equally between those. Then I need to go and get some redstone which is going to be a bit of a tall order because I don't have much left after the sugarcane farm. A sugarcane farm which by the way is now dressed up in its own hobbit hole. I basically went for exactly the same design, reversed the door, it still operates the same way with the button there in the center activating it. We went with the oak door that I took away from the other one because I still quite liked the oak door design and inside our sugarcane farm is simply enclosed with a chest in the floor there so we can get hold of the produce and we got some glow berries and lanterns lighting this place inside to make sure there are no surprise creepers when I walk through the door. Anyway the potions we have brewed have a three minute duration. To increase that duration to eight minutes we are going to add some redstone dust in. Redstone dust will extend the length of basically any potion you have brewed but it will only do that once, so the maximum duration a potion can reach is 8 minutes. And there we go, we got the local brewery advancement for brewing our first potion. You can, by the way, get that much easier by just putting a bottle of water in the brewing stand and taking it back out. But the fact is we have now brewed a few potions of night vision. The next thing I'm going to work towards is potions of water breathing, because you may have guessed it by now already, I am planning on going and taking on that ocean monument at some point soon. So I guess we'll stash some of the potions in this barrel down here for now until I'm ready for them, but it's good to know that we have some of those potions stored up and that we can start brewing a few more. For that though, we're going to have to go fishing. So I've crafted myself a fishing rod. You could also buy one from a village fisherman and it looks like <laughs> love is in the air while they're trying to breed a few more villagers for the population of the village. We might even, yep, we saw some thunder clouds there and that kind of indicates that there aren't enough beds in the village. Even though the villagers are in the mood to breed, they will not be producing any more which is good because I don't really want zombie sieges to happen in this area. One other thing I should mention is that the junior librarian, the one that we bred up in the last episode, now trades Looting 3 and Luck of the Sea 1 as well. So I could buy that Luck of the Sea enchantment if I wanted to upgrade my fishing rod, but I'm probably just going to head to the river and start fishing. So fishing has gone through a few permutations since I covered it in the Minecraft survival guide originally. Most notably, it's gone through a change where there is a certain area around the fishing bobber that has to be clear of blocks or any other obstructions if you want to fish. Or rather, you can still fish within a certain area, but you are less likely to get treasure from fishing, which is kind of what we want to get from here. But no, there we go, we've got ourselves our first fish and earned the fishy business advancement. And now I need to go and sleep. So I guess I better clarify that because that was a bit of a rushed explanation. You can fish in basically any source of water and you'll notice these particles start popping up on the surface. As soon as a trail of particles ends up heading towards your fishing bobber, that's a sign that you're about to catch a fish. Once the bobber dips under the surface of the water, you right click again to reel in and you should catch something 
out of that. But in order to catch more interesting items like treasure, the bobber has to have a 5x5 area centered on the bobber, clear of any obstructions. And that also includes a couple of blocks below and above the surface as well to make sure that you haven't set up something that's going to allow you to AFK fish. And this was kind of the developer response or nerf, I suppose, to the practice of AFK fishing farms, basically setting up a contraption that reeled the bobber in for you automatically when you caught a fish and then immediately recast it. And you could basically hold down a button or set some sort of macro up which would fish stuff for you overnight. And through that, people would gather an awful lot of treasure items. Now, I believe it is still possible to set up AFK fishing farms, although they are a bit more complicated and I'm probably not going to cover them in this series. And it looks like we just fished up our first piece of treasure. There we go. We have an unbreaking three and mending fishing rod, which is not going to get us any more fish or items any faster, but it is going to repair itself as we go with the experience that we gain from fishing. A lot of the time when I start a new world, I tend to make a basic fishing rod and then fish until the fishing rod actually catches me a better fishing rod. And from there, if we start to fish up more enchanted fishing rods, we can combine them until we have a maxed out enchanted fishing rod and it fully repairs itself every time we fish anything up. But that's why I prefer to fish in open areas like this, like rivers or like the ocean, so that you maximize the opportunity to get yourself some treasure. And there are specific biomes you can fish in that have slightly different loot tables. For example, fishing in a jungle gives you the opportunity to acquire bamboo from fishing, which can't really be done in any other place. But in this case, what I'm really after is a pretty standard fish anyway. We are looking for a puffer fish because that's the next ingredient we want for our potion brewing journey to make ourselves a potion of water breathing. It's worth noting, of course, that there are some fish in this river to begin with. Fish actually appear as mobs in the world, and if you have a bucket of water, you can scoop one up like so in a bucket to get a different advancement for tactical fishing, and that will allow you to place a live fish anywhere else in the world. Of course, the live fish can also be killed to get the type of fish you get through fishing, but the act of fishing with a rod will not get you a live fish, so that's an important distinction to make if you want to fill up a fish tank with some of these folks, catch them live out of the river in a bucket. The puffer fish we're looking for can also be found and killed out there in the wild, although I'm fairly certain they only appear in warm oceans and we just hooked one on our fishing rod, so we can get one of those basically anywhere we wanted to. We also hooked ourselves a bottle of water as one of the junk items that you can get from treasure, so I only need to make a couple more glass bottles and we're already on our way to having our potions of water breathing. And in the meantime, I'm going to clear out a bit of my inventory because it is kind of a giant mess, but before we do that, I'm going to head over to the nether portal since it is a nether related block. I'm going to plant a little nether wart garden around here and that's where we are going to grow some nether warts on the soul sand that we found it on in the nether fortress. That's going to grow like any other crop does, although you can't bone meal nether warts to have it grow a little bit faster. You can, like with the other crops, harvest it with fortune though. So once this nether wart is fully grown, we can harvest it with fortune to get a couple more nether wart out of it than we normally would. I'm going to leave the looting three book I got from the librarian in here, and at some point we're going to have to get hold of a better sword, because I think we've been working with just plain old sharpness three for a little too long. But with that taken care of, we can turn our awkward potions, which is what they are once they've had nether wart applied to to them into potions of water breathing using a puffer fish. And the last of our redstone dust is going towards making these water breathing potions an eight minute duration so that they can last a little bit longer when we go to take on that ocean monument in the next episode. One thing you'll notice is it's kind of difficult to distinguish between which potion is which when they are a similar color. So the night vision potions and the water breathing potions are both shades of blue, which are kind of difficult to distinguish between when they have this enchantment glow over them. There are resource packs you can get that dull down the enchantment enchantment glow and I have used those in previous seasons but for now we're just going to have to mouse over them to see what's going on with these potions or just keep them in a decent order so that you remember which ones are which. What I figured we might do for the rest of this episode though is move forward with the other potions you might need. Starting with the one that doesn't need nether warts, we're going to brew some potions of weakness, the better to de-zombify some of these villagers if the worst should happen to them. That starts off with a spider eye, but we need to do a couple of other things to the spider eye, which is going to require some sugarcane from our sugarcane farm. Just one of those is needed because it will convert directly into sugar, and then we need to go and find a brown mushroom. Brown mushrooms in the overworld are most commonly found in forest biomes and in caves. You can also 
also find giant variants of the mushrooms growing on mushroom islands or in dark oak forests. And I often find that a swamp is a good place to start looking for them, although having cast my eye around both of the regions of this swamp, it doesn't seem to have any. That's okay though, because a stone's throw away is this dark oak forest, and this has examples of not just the brown mushrooms, but also the giant red mushrooms, which I'll get so that we can talk a little bit about suspicious stew in this episode as well. I actually had a bit of a tough time finding a brown mushroom in this dark oak forest, but we've got one here. I'm just going to take the rest of it down. We could always regrow it if we want to, but it makes a nice little clearing here in the forest. So between the spider eye, the sugar, and a brown mushroom, we also got a couple of other useful ingredients here. We can make a fermented spider eye, and putting that in without even turning the water bottles into awkward potions with a nether wart first will still brew up a potion of weakness. And once the potion of weakness is brewed, throwing in some gunpowder will turn it into a splash potion of weakness, which is the ideal thing for curing a zombie villager. Basically, if you encounter a zombified villager, or if one of your villagers is turned into a zombie, first make sure it's not going to burn in the sunlight, then splash it with a splash potion of weakness, which you can simply throw using a right click, feed it a golden apple, and it will start converting back into a regular villager. They'll even be so grateful for converting them that you'll get some discounts. But we're not going to tackle that right now, we're just going to leave our splash potions of weakness in this barrel. We'll potentially do some villager curing in future, but for now I think it is worth noting that villagers will not spawn naturally in a village. If there is a village with buildings present but there are no villagers around, they're not just going to magically pop up one day. And so if you want to restart a villager's population, the best way to do that is by curing some zombie villagers that spawn in the nearby area. While I was explaining that, one of our young villagers grew up and has now adopted the cleric's profession. And I will say this right now, do not sleep on clerics. They are a vital source of redstone dust when you don't want to go mining for it. And having just used up my last redstone dust on brewing up those potions before, it's an ideal time to buy some from the villagers. So with a handful of emeralds gotten from the Fletchers, we can buy ourselves a ton of redstone dust. We get 24 per trade cycle, and once he unlocks, he also starts selling us lapis lazuli for enchanting, and he will buy gold ingots from us for emeralds as well. Clerics are also a great place to dump any rotten flesh that you got hold of from the hordes of zombies that you fight overnight, or from a zombie spawner like the one we have over there in the flower forest. So potentially, we could see ourselves converting those for the future. For now though, I'm going to buy some lapis and some redstone, because this guy is going to trade me them as much as I want. Going back to the potions that we might actually want to use, and the ones that require nether warts, we're going to be making some potions of fire resistance. And the main ingredient in these is magma cream, which you can get from killing magma cubes in the nether. Usually the medium stage magma cubes will drop them once killed. But if you're having trouble getting hold of those or you really don't feel like fighting a magma cube yet, you can also craft some magma cream using a slime ball and some blaze powder. That will make one magma cream, which can of course be turned into three potions of fire resistance with a longer duration because we've traded with the cleric for some redstone. There we go, three potions of fire resistance. Very, very nice, very handy to have and definitely something that will save your life if you are stranded in the nether and falling into a lava lake. Next up we're going to brew some potions of strength which is going to require blaze powder in the potion ingredients slot instead of in the fuel slot although I'll keep another one in there for refueling the brewing stand once it runs out of fuel. And potions of strength actually have a second level to them that you can apply some glowstone dust to turn it from a potion of strength into a potion of strength 2 which will give you a higher attack damage bonus. It's worth noting that this will decrease the duration of the potion though. It kind of balances out a little bit so that it's a 1 minute 30 potion of strength 2 instead of a 3 minute potion of strength and once that's been applied you cannot increase the duration with redstone dust. It's either glowstone or redstone. You cannot have both on the same potion. The last one we're going to make in this episode is a potion of regeneration designed to help you regenerate health. The active ingredient here is a gas tier and you can also improve that with glowstone to get a potion of regeneration too. The interesting thing here though is that the base potion of regeneration will last for 45 seconds and will regenerate roughly half a heart or one point of health every 2.5 seconds, meaning that in total you end up with nine hearts regenerated. If you add glowstone to this, it becomes a potion of regeneration too, and it heals half a heart in half the time, which means that you end up healing a full heart of health every 2.5 seconds. Unfortunately though, the glowstone has decreased the amount of time that this potion is active for, meaning that a regen 2 potion will heal you faster than a regular regen 1 potion, but it won't heal as much health. It will actually only end up healing eight and a half hearts instead 
instead of 9. And so while technically it will heal you faster, the base regeneration potion is actually going to heal more than the regen 2 potion, which is kind of an odd thing, but it's, it's twice as potent, but half as long. Of course, we can extend the length of the regeneration potion by making it a longer potion with redstone dust, meaning that it will give us that regen effect for twice as long, ultimately healing twice as many hearts over a longer period of time. So we end up with 18 hearts worth of health healed by a regen potion with redstone dust, making it the best regen potion overall, as long as you can wait it out and you've got the time. So a regular regen potion is probably the thing to use if you're taking slow damage, and a regen 2 potion is the one that you want to throw on yourself if you've just fallen into lava. It probably won't save you still, but it will give you a little bit more time to think and maybe escape. We're going to put each of those into this chest here alongside our other potions and that's probably all I'm going to cover for potions in this episode. There are a few others like potions of healing which can do you a bit of extra healing in a pinch using glistering melons. There are potions of speed there are swiftness potions which use sugar as the active ingredient, there are jump boost potions that use rabbit's feet, and there are a few other potions that circumstantially we are going to use later in this series. But for now, I will leave it up to the Minecraft wiki to explain the rest of brewing to you. There is a fantastic graphic there that has a flowchart of how to brew all of the different potions, including some of the negative ones like poison and slowness and what exactly they do. For the last portion of this video, however, we are going to go flower picking in the flower forest, because after a little run through here, we should be able to gather most of the flowers, not all of them, notably, but most of the flowers we need to make the different kinds of suspicious stew. So our shopping list here involves an allium, which is a flower you can only get in a flower forest, azure bluets, which are pretty common more or less everywhere, any colour of tulip, an oxeye daisy, a dandelion and a poppy, a cornflower and a lily of the valley. For the final flower on today's list, we're going to to return to the swamp to get ourselves a blue orchid. So as we found out in the last episode by trading with the farmer, suspicious stew is a food stuff that will refill your hunger but will also give you seemingly a random potion effect. But the effects are not random if we craft the suspicious stew ourselves. So I'm going to make myself a few bowls here and we're going to go into crafting each of the types of suspicious stew except for one. The suspicious stew that gives you the wither status effect can only be crafted with a wither rose and that is obtained by the wither killing a mob. So we can't really get hold of any of those yet because I don't have the ingredients for a wither fight nor am I especially prepared for it. So I think what we're going to do now is just craft all of the other suspicious stews in the meantime. And we can do this away from the villagers because they can just be crafted in a 2x2 two two crafting inventory. Every suspicious stew starts with a base of mushroom soup and then adding a flower to this will turn it into suspicious stew. We will start with the oxide daisy because that's a really useful one. Eating this will actually give you a quick burst of regeneration. As you can see, we get about eight seconds of regeneration before the effect wears off. That is useful to know if you plan on crafting a Lily of the Valley suspicious stew because that one will give you 12 seconds of the poison effect. Now, don't worry too much about me. I'm taking a little bit of damage, but my armor is absorbing most of it. The poison effect lasts for 12 seconds and will then clear up. And it looks like, yep, I didn't take a single heart of damage that time because my armor is just that good. Also, probably because my saturation was quite high from eating golden carrots. Saturation is this behind the scenes value that is basically how long it takes for you to get hungry again and the higher your saturation the more likely it is that you're going to heal up any hearts of damage that you take. Saturation and hunger are the two factors that basically contribute to natural health regeneration outside of potion effects and so forth. But anyway that was regeneration and poison, two fairly opposite effects. Next up we're going to put a pink tulip in here, pull out this suspicious stew and that is going to give us the weakness effect that we just brewed up a potion for. That's the one that's traded from the farmer right now and as you can see doesn't really have a great deal of a positive effect on the player. Speaking of saturation though, crafting a suspicious stew with a dandelion will give you a short boost of saturation. It's so fast that it doesn't really appear on the potions HUD for very long so you can just about see it. You'll get a chance to see it again now if you look up in the top right because a suspicious stew crafted with a blue orchid will have exactly the same effect. You get that very very brief hunger shank appearing in the top right and then that's it, it's gone for good. That gives you 0.35 seconds of saturation boost on Java Edition which really isn't all that worth it but it's worth making note of here. Making one with an Azure Bluet is going to be kind of a confusing effect because it gives you blindness, basically it stops you from seeing within about a 3 or 4 block radius around you that doesn't change even if your render distance is different. As of right now there are no other mobs or potions in the game that provide the blindness status 
suspicious effect and as your blue at suspicious stew is the only way to get it and we'll need that later if we want to attempt the how did we get here advancement for now let's take a quick look at the allium suspicious stew which will give you an equally fairly useless four seconds of fire resistance nobody's really going to be carrying allium suspicious stew around with them because stew is not stackable so i doubt people are really going to have that in a pinch to save them from fire but you know maybe if a skeleton shoots you with a flame bow or something like that I can see it being useful. Cornflowers are an interesting one because those will give you a few seconds of jump boost, allowing you to jump a little bit higher. It sort of feels like you have moon gravity for six seconds before the potion effect wears off and you come back down to earth. And finally, we come full circle to the first potion that we brewed. A suspicious stew with a poppy will give you night vision. And for this, I think we need to go find a nearby cave. Here we go. Here's a cave that I haven't explored that we can quickly hop down into. As you can see, pretty dark in here. Once we eat this suspicious stew, it lights up the darkness around us for a total of about five seconds and then the effect wears off and we are plunged into darkness once again but at least that could be a neat way of seeing what's ahead of you in a cave if you are running out of torches and you've got a poppy suspicious stew on you and that little caving trip actually brought us to a sunflower plane so i'm going to grab a few sunflowers so that we can grow those back at the base now, as we learned from our friend the farmer last time, Suspicious Stew is a bit of a risky business because there's nothing about the item itself that indicates whether or not it has a certain status effect. You basically have a luck of the draw when you're buying it from farmers and they will always trade you the same two types of Suspicious Stew. So now that we know those are weakness and poison, we could buy those if we ever wanted them again, but chances are we don't. Naturally though, if you as a player are crafting a bunch of suspicious stew, then you probably want to label it in an anvil or something, or at least keep your chests somewhat organized so that you can make sure that you are getting the right sort of suspicious stew every time, because nobody wants to pick up a suspicious stew of regen and instead find that it gave you the wither effect and the poison is fatal. Suspicious stew and its base mushroom soup also aren't stackable. You can't get multiple of these into the same slot they won't occupy the same space there so it's not really worth having a huge amount of it on you it can't be as good as a stackable food source like steak or golden carrots or pork chops or anything like that but they are quite nice to have around you also can't craft suspicious stew from mushroom soup and a flower the flower has to go in as the soup is being made so that is something that's worth keeping in mind and thank you to everybody who suggested that i compost all of the cookies that i bought from the farmer in the last episode because the last thing i'm going to show you is how to grow giant mushrooms it's very easy it just takes bone meal the way it does with an ordinary sapling but the best place to plant them is either on mycelium or podzol because normally mushrooms require a dark space in order to grow but mycelium and podzol allow you to plant them in full daylight and then simply spamming them with bone meal will grow one into a giant mushroom we should be able to do the same with the brown mushroom over here while they do need a fair amount of space to grow and then we can chop all of these down again with a decent chance to get a couple of mushrooms out of each of these blocks and that's how we end up farming mushrooms if we want to make more suspicious stew in future but i think that's going to be it for this episode of the hardcore survival guide thank you folks so much for hanging out as i brew a few potions and talk about suspicious stew i hope you learned something from this episode and i hope you're excited for the next episode where we will hopefully be able to go and tackle that ocean monument i need to get hold of death strider for my boots and respiration for my helmet but hopefully fingers crossed that trip will prove successful in the meantime thanks again for watching my name has been pixel riffs please leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it subscribe to my channel if you want to see more and i'll see you guys soon take care bye for now